Hello, TPC listeners. Before we start today's episode, we just want to extend our thoughts and condolences to Jimmy Greaves' family and friends at this time of their sad loss. We will look into Jimmy Greaves' career and legacy in one of our future episodes. Thank you. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Premier Chels, your source for all things Premier League, but starting with Chelsea first. Coming to you on your speakers and headsets, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Jackie from Houston, I have Rahul here from Connecticut, and a special, special guest, but you guys are very familiar with this name, Alex is back, and he's coming into us from France. How's it going, Alex? It's going quite well. I'm happy to be back. It's been a while, it's been busy, but... Uh, I'm I'm here from across the pond, actually considerably closer than you guys are to London, where we just handed out quite the nice little uh, second half thrashing. I was going to say you're so close to London, you could probably hear the screams and you can probably see some blue color floating out of there, right? Yeah, exactly. There's London is only one color at this point. So, <laughs> wow. Well, that's good, excellent. Good, good day to return. That's Absolutely. All We're glad to see you back. It's been a while, but, you know, we always love having you on here. Rahul, I'm sure you're excited to see your background change today. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. I mean, we won. Uh, the Premier Shows account hit a 7,000 of followers, and we got Alex back on the podcast. So uh, it's a good way to kind of wrap up the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. But I think enough catching up right now. Maybe we need to dive right into the game because maybe the listeners can sense we're super excited. We're recording barely a few minutes after the game's wrapped up so maybe some raw emotion out today but Alex I'll start with you thoughts really quickly Uh, I mean there's no better way uh I don't know there's nothing better than beating a London rival there's nothing better than beating Spurs doing it on their ground too um it was just the epitome of a top class performance and what I love about this is even though it was it was such a good game you could tell we weren't even at our best um in that the first half we we weren't really in control um we were missing chances throughout the game our final third play wasn't quite at its at its flowing best um and yet we come away with a three nil win against one of our fierce rivals though i don't know maybe that's being a little generous to tottenham at this point in time (laughs) but uh one of our our local rivals we will say um this was just the epitome of a of, of a perfect game plan, a perfect execution, um, the entire team stepping up. And as I said to people online, um, the fact that, you know, you you heard a little bit of criticism, I'm sure we'll dive into that more, that Mason Mount didn't have the most fantastic game. Some of our attackers weren't at their absolute best. Lukaku, unlucky not to get some assists, but he didn't score. And yet, even when these big names up top aren't at their very best, two of our center backs and a holding midfielder <laughs> were able to score. I guess Conte, you could say, is a little more dynamic than your traditional defensive mid. But when when we're not getting goals up top and three of our defensively minded players are scoring for a comfortable 3-0 win over a big rival, there's not much more you can ask. And you've got to give credit to the man who is Rahul's Zoom background, and that is Thomas Tuchel, because this was Spurs were outclassed and this was a Tuchel masterclass. Well said, and it's good to have you back, Alex, because you bring a little bit of spice to the podcast with the early shots fired at Tottenham, as I would say. They're no longer our rivals, maybe just local rivals, but no longer Premier League rivals. But good, well said. Rahul, it seems to be the theme recently with Chelsea. We've discussed this in the last episodes that we're not necessarily going into fourth, fifth, sixth gear. We're in that first or second gear, but we still come away winning games. We do, and, and the foundation is that, of that is our defence. Um, we spoke about Mendy a few games ago and um, Kepa comes in for him and can't really think of any major saves he had to make uh, throughout this game. Maybe that one against Son in the, uh, towards the end of the first half. And that's credit to the system and that's credit to the defenders in front of him that know exactly what they have to do. And I'm sure we'll touch on one of them who's, who got the goal, but was just overall very calming and knew exactly what he was doing to Thiago Silva. Um, And apart from that, I agree with Alex, our attack was lacking today. But like I said, I think it was last episode where you would ask me, is it concerning that Chelsea aren't getting into the the fifth, sixth gear uh, and only winning games due to Lukaku? When I said, well, we do have defenders that can score. And they popped up today. And then N'Golo Conte adds another one. And he does love scoring against uh, Spurs. Yeah, that's the beauty of the squad that we have. There seems to be talent in multiple positions, actually. You can get a couple left backs, a couple right backs. And 
Speaking of the starting 11 today, a couple of changes. You touched on Kepa because Mendy was out injured. Uh, Alonso keeps his place. There's a lot of talk about Chilwell making his reappearance recently, but Alonso seems to be in fine form. And then Aspilicueta coming back in at right wing back instead of Reese James. So good to see that we've got a good mix. And other than that, the predicted 11 that we had talked about with Mount, Kai Havertz, Lukaku starting up front seems to be retained as the same. But uh, we'll jump, jump into that first half and talk a little bit about it. Um, you guys have talked about a, a very good masterclass from Tuchel. But that first half, we weren't necessarily up to par. And I think credit to him for seeing that right away, right, Alex? Yeah, it was, it was a slower start. Um, and it wasn't, even, it wasn't even that we weren't creating anything. It was just that we didn't really have a foothold on the game. Uh, maybe we're a little spoiled in that with the quality of the squad and the manager we have, we expect to be asserting our will on games. We don't always want it to just be a back and forth um opposing pressure um we're really looking to take a hold of a game and dominate it and that's why this really was as we've said a, a tale of the two halves because when Tuchel noticed that he made a few little adjustments um the team sort of stepped up in the second half I thought we were just a lot more fluid and we came out flying obviously getting a goal helps um when you get a goal immediately after uh, the restart, because then then you you taste blood, you know, you can get some more. Um, the opposition is forced to push a little more, which gives space to you. So it's just not um, I mean, you, you can't ask any more from from a team uh, than going in in a tough, closely contested game and then coming out from halftime, probably with some some fiery words from Tuchel in the locker room and then just asserting your authority and pulling away with it. So I was very impressed. Um, and I, I've been saying this for a while now. We all have. We are so lucky to have Thomas Tuchel as our manager. Indeed we are. And fiery words aside, Rahul, Mason Mount seems to have been, for lack of a better word, an untouchable player under Tuchel for a long, long time now. He's a fan favorite. He seems to always put in a good shift. That first half wasn't his best. We're not here to say... He hasn't been amazing over the last year and a half or so, but it wasn't his best. And Tuchel saw that or had the bravery to pull him off. Your thoughts on that one? And actually, you put up a poll on Instagram talking about the moment of the match. And there's quite a few people talking about that halftime substitution, how Mason is a lot of people's favorite player, but Tuchel made the right decision and the brave decision. He did. And I mean, from when the news broke or when the rumors were coming out that he was looking to bring on Conte at halftime, uh, your mind goes to, it's going to be a direct switch for either Jorginho or Kovacic. Uh, but I had to also put out another poll. I said someone else in my mind, I thought maybe Mason Mount might be the guy that comes off. And Tuchel touched on it too, that it, on paper, it looks like a defensive switch in terms of you're bringing off an attacking midfielder for a, or more holding or, or defensive player in Conte. Um, but that wasn't his whole purpose of I want to control the midfield. Yes, that was part of it, but that was also a message that he was sending to his squad that um, I can take anybody off at any time I want. Doesn't matter who you are, and I need you guys to be performing at a hundred percent. First half, not most of them were at a hundred percent. Maybe only Thiago Silva, um, and so I think that switch kind of you know woke people up. And and Mason Mount's got to take it in his stride, and I know he will. Um, that he wasn't good enough and he's got to be better. And it's actually been maybe a couple of games now where he's been below what we expect him to be. Um, and so it's an, an opportunity for him to kind of bounce back and, and show the Mason Mount that we've seen uh, for the most part of this year. Yeah, honestly, we have a lot of players in those positions. I mean, it's not just Mason Mount. You've got Kai Havitz, Timo Werner. We talked about Pulisic to come back. You've got... Um, Hakim Ziyech, even Callum hudson Doyle, and, and I bring up Callum last because last year something interesting happened where Callum came on as a second half sub and I think played about 10 or 15 minutes and Tuchel was not happy and pulled him off and so it's almost like reminding the squad that if you don't pick up the messages I'm giving you or telling you what to do you'll sit on the bench and it's not it's nothing personal because right. if you go back to the Callum situation he brought him back into the team a few games later and he played really really well so Alex, I'll bring you into this discussion because we do have a lot of competition for places here. Do you think he's handling this correctly? I think he's absolutely handling it well. And that's sometimes tough to say as like a big Pulisic fan, personally, uh, you often say, oh, Captain America is being a little hard done by uh, with selection choices. Um, or as, as we've said, a lot of people uh, feel that, you know, sometimes 
certain players aren't aren't being given enough of a chance. You mentioned Hudson Adoy. I know uh, that's one name a lot of people would like to see a little more of. But the thing is, when a player gets given their chance and they go into some good form, you rarely see them dropped for no reason. Um, he's not rotating for the sake of rotating, but he's rotating within a very deep squad among a lot of top class players. Um, and he's doing it generally what seems to be on merit. And the thing, the thing that encourages me here is um, if, if we segue a little bit to Christian Pulisic, who, who I suppose is uh, the main man behind my account uh, in, in one sense and uh, my personal favorite player, a lot of people say, oh, he needs to find some more game time. Maybe he's even going to leave Chelsea or something like that because uh, he, there are too many attackers ahead of him in the rotation. But what this shows, I mean, as we said, Mason Mount, I love him. He's top class. You have to love him as a guy. He's an academy product. He's brilliant on his day. Um, but he's had a few subpar performances He's um, that just aren't up to his own high standards. Um, and that's okay. And, and Tuchel being willing to rotate shows that – for a player like Pulisic, who's now um, been training individually for a little while now, I think he's recovering from the knock he sustained on international duty. Um, there's nothing blocking his path to the first team at this point. Mason Mount hasn't exactly impressed in the last couple appearances. So there is nothing saying that if Pulisic or hudson Adoy even are really impressing in training, get a chance to go out there and impress the coach, they could absolutely make a run in the first team. So I, it's it's always going to be tough because you have a lot of top players. They all want to play. You have a lot of fans who have fan favorites. Um, you're never going to be able to satisfy everyone, but frankly, um, I, I cannot complain at all from what Tuchel seems to be doing. Uh, and I'm hoping there's some more healthy competition as we go because um, a deep squad is what allows you to go deep in multiple competitions. It's what allows you to win trophies. And I think this could be a big year for Chelsea if we keep using our strength correctly. Yeah, fingers crossed, nicely said. And thank you for the Pulisic update because I've been wondering when or if when he's going to go back into training. It sounds like he is. And then hopefully we'll get to see him here in the next few weeks, especially with back-to-back -back games coming up so quickly. And, you know, he, he does like a goal against Manchester City, which is coming down the pipeline. So hopefully we get to see him in there as well. Rahul, should we talk goals now? I think that's something we need to, to talk a little bit about and get a little bit more excited on the podcast here. Yeah, no, absolutely. And just before we move on from the Mason Mount point, Earlier in the week, Tuchel was very complimentary of Mason Mount and how it's difficult to leave him out sometimes. Um, and then to follow up with this kind of substitution keeps Mason Mount honest that I appreciate everything you're doing, but you've got to continue doing that. So that I just wanted to add that part. And coming to the goals, I mean, second half, first half, we didn't really have any opportunities. Maybe a Mason Mount where he snatched at it uh, and Kai Havertz seemed to for lack of a better term, just want to lazily put it away instead of, you know, smashing it. But second half, we come to it, and, and who else but Thiago Silva. Um, movement in the box from a corner, kind of just floating around, which means no one's really picking him up, and, and that's dangerous in itself. And then he connects with the ball and makes it 1-0. Uh, and from that point on, you knew if Chelsea were to get that first goal, we were going to push on. You know, Spurs would doubt themselves a little, especially at home with their fans that are not very happy with the way things are going. Uh, it was always going to play into our hands, and it exactly did with the second coming, yes, massive deflection, but N'Golo Conte, super sub at halftime, makes it 2-0. Yeah, great, great, great. And Alex, you put up a post of Thiago Silva kissing the Chelsea badge after scoring that goal. Your thoughts on his celebration? Yeah, that was... <laughs> It's exactly what you want to see um, because as soon as he came in, every Chelsea fan sort of immediately liked him because he was saying the right things. He was showing his class. He was showing his experience. His entire family were conveying that they were hardcore Chelsea fans. We know uh, <laughs> his wife even got into some hot water because she was so <laughs> passionately uh, cheering on the team. Um, it's it's just been great. And, and his kids, his sons are, are extremely excited. They're always hyping up Chelsea. Um, it's just a, a proper blue family uh, from the beginning. And you love to see it because, I mean, he didn't come from a direct rival, but he came from another top European club in PSG. Um, he'd been there for a while. So you wonder how well he's going to adjust, whether he's going to fit in, whether he's going to enjoy it. Um, but kissing the Chelsea badge, showing his appreciation uh, to the Chelsea faithful. Uh, I thought that was, that was a touch of class for him. And 
he's aging in reverse. What can we say? Uh, <laughs> what a signing that was. And the fact that we got him for free yeah. is unbelievable um, because I mean, that's just, that's just a business masterclass there because you've gotten the top class player or top class leader and a top class guy um, who's clearly inspiring those around him as well. Yeah. What a beautiful moment to see him kiss the badge and, Rahul, honestly, when we signed Tiago Silva, one thing that was interesting to me was I thought he was there to play a season, maybe coach the younger defenders, the likes of Christensen, maybe some of the youth coming through, right. uh, organize and play a couple of games here and there. But at his age, 36, he seems to, like Alex saying, going in the right direction or wrong direction, aging backwards. He's become a stalwart. He's become, you know, first choice almost in every game. Uh, other than the goal, I thought he was probably one of the best players on the pitch, energy, energy wise, leadership wise. Uh, I think maybe I've taken all the words you were about to say, but maybe share a minute about Thiago Silva here. No, you, you both are spot on, and it's the goals, the cherry on the on, on the top. But his defending in that first half, just reading the game, um, Son for some reason was playing as the main striker, which means he's always going to outpace Thiago Silva, but he never did because Thiago always gave himself the, the positioning and the opportunity to be in a spot where he never got outpaced. Right. Um, and that's the experience and that's the knowledge that he's gained over the years, 36, about to turn 37. Uh, and the other thing, I think a few months ago, maybe a month ago, so at this point, he came out and said he was hurt by the fact that PSG brought in Sergio Ramos and gave him two years um, at the exact age that Thiago Solo was and was asking for two years. So it's almost added a little bit of fire, not that he needed it, but a little bit of fire in him to say, I'm going to prove to not just everyone in the Premier League, but even at PSG and my other clubs that I can still do the business and he's doing it in the best yeah. league. Indeed. And I need to slide in there that he won the Champions League as well, <laughs> something that PSG did not do. So let me slide that in there. But let's move on, Rahul. I'll stick with you for a quick second before I come back to Alex about N'Golo Kante. You said he took a shot. Uh, massive deflection goes in, but I think you've got to uh, buy a lottery ticket to win the lottery, right? You do, and he did, and um, I think it was deflection off of Dyer. Yeah. Um, but it was a goal was coming. A second goal was kind of just about around the corner, and if it came that way, um, no one was going to complain. And if it came for N'Golo Conte, everyone's happy for him. Yep. Uh, and that just really, again, I think we've spoken about this last episode, was Chelsea don't stop after getting one they want to get a second they want to get a third because we just put ourselves in a position where then we can play our game and not worry about oh if they nick a goal on the other end what happens and yes another deflection but no one's complaining we get two goals in and we could have made it three four five uh towards the end of that game but the third one did come from no one else but my player of the season so far antonio rudiger so hold on to that rudiger thought for just a second alex Kante is not the most frequent of goal scorers out there, but him coming on almost added that energy, that pace, that excitement to that midfield. And we were rewarded with a goal. I mean, I think it's something worthwhile to see that when he's fit and he's on his day, he, he pretty much walks into the team or and many other teams around in the Premier League and world uh, any day, right? Absolutely. I mean, he's clearly, clearly one of the best midfield players in the world. There are arguments to be made that he is maybe on his day, the best midfielder in the world. Certainly in terms of his position and the role he plays, he's absolutely at the very top. And what I love too, I mean, we were discussing the Conte substitution and saying maybe that's a slightly more defensive switch on paper, but him bringing that extra uh, fire to the midfield also gave a little bit of cover and allowed the wingbacks to get up further. So you saw for all of the second half, Alonzo <laughs> was absolutely peppering the, the Tottenham goal. Um, and that's the Alonzo also actually is one of our defenders who loves a goal in a London Derby. So he was inches from getting on the, the score sheet on a couple occasions. Yeah. And it's, it's just so good seeing a team that's this dynamic where Maybe our, our first game plan isn't working. Our pure, our pure, our effort to go through our pure attackers isn't quite working. With one midfield switch of this extremely talented man in N'Golo Conte, you're now freeing the likes of Marcus Alonso to cause havoc in the box. You're causing all sorts of interplay. 
and Conte as well. I think he had a, a chance. I'm not sure if it was him um, or Romelu Lukaku who had the final ball, but they were linking up, especially later in the game. I mean, we, we look at 3-0 and say that's a great score line. As always, maybe with Chelsea, I feel like we always complain about this. This could have been a 6-0 game yeah. with Werner uh, had a, a completely open shot on his left foot, but tried to check it back and couldn't get it away. Um, Kovacic completely, I mean, what a player. He, he was outstanding. He has been great this season, but he is allergic to shooting uh, <laughs> because he was clear on goal. Perfect opportunity. I mean, normally jokingly you say, oh, I could have put that in. I feel like I could have maybe curled that around the keeper, but hey, Mateo Kovacic, top class. He needs to shoot. He needs to put that in. Um, but even with some of our players wasting a few of these opportunities, I mean, we won three nil. I just, I don't know. I, I, I love the fact that I can have these higher expectations because we have such a good squad, such a good manager. I would have, it would have been that little extra cherry on top or extra few cherries on top to absolutely thrash Spurs, something like six nil. And you say, oh, that's ridiculous. That's crazy. But Chelsea, looking at the stats, had 20 shots, 20 chances created um, to Tottenham six. They had three big chances to Tottenham's one, um, had a little bit more possession, higher pass success, um, over double the corners. We really, truly did take a hold of that game. And again, just going back to that point that we weren't really ever in our very highest gear, I feel like we're just cruising through collecting wins and collecting clean sheets. So. Yep. Uh, there, there's there's too many too many good things to talk about at this point but i'm just loving what i'm seeing i actually grabbed onto a couple of words you said there with lukaku linking up with players uh, you know the last couple of episodes we've hyped a lot of praise on lukaku for his goals but i thought his link up play today was very very good i thought he was holding up players he would control the ball little one twos with mason with kai in that first half second half like you said he brought timo into the game he brought Conte into the game so i think that's a part of his game that when he doesn't score, we don't talk about. And yes, we praise him a lot, but it's good to note that he does those things and brings other players into the team. So hopefully we'll see the likes of Timo, Kai, Mason contribute more with goals because of Lukaku's presence up front. But Rahul, I see you itching to talk about the German players here. And I know you want to talk about your player of the season, Rudiger. But before we go into that, because he scored a lovely, lovely goal, assisted by a German, by the way. But maybe talk a little bit about Kai, Timo and, and Rudiger. Yeah, I'll, so I'll start with Kai. I mean, he started alongside Lukaku, maybe as a front two, but also kept dropping to help out with the midfield. Um, and this parts of this game reminded me of Kai from last season, where he was just kind of going through the motions and not really in it like he has been. Maybe maybe in a Champions League final, I get that's a whole different ball game than playing um, little Spurs away from home, but. You kind of just expect more from him, and I wasn't seeing that. Even sometimes he would miss a simple pass, and I was getting frustrated with him. Uh, now, again, when you have a team full of winners like we do and, and other people contributing through goals, it doesn't really get highlighted as much. But in, if we go on and lose this game, you sit there and question, like, well, what was Kai Havertz's role today? And that's kind of what I was trying to get at with when you and I were talking Um is that we just expect a little bit more from him. And then Timo Werner comes on and um, you're almost excited to see him because you haven't really seen much of him this season. And he gets his couple of opportunities. He snatches, like Alex was saying. And um, it's almost like where, uh, like you're waiting for that moment with Timo Werner where things turn around and it's not coming yet. But this is just the beginning of the season. And he assisted, like you said, for our third German player in Rudiger, who's been immense. I mean... Talk about Thiago Silva, who's been excellent. T Rudiger, who's played every minute of every Premier League game this season and conceded one goal, and that was from a penalty. I mean, he's been excellent, and then he pops up with a goal and, and, and gets the first Spurs fans all, all riled up with his, what are you saying? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's just the character of him. And, and like I told him in the last episode, sign that contract. Yeah, absolutely. Rudiger has been immense, and I thought his movement – for that goal was incredible. I was like, is that a center back or is that a center forward just kind of watching where the play is, how congested it was towards the penalty spot and he moved a little bit outside and credit to Timo Warner. I know you've been a little bit harsh on him, not tremendously, but a little bit harsh on him here where he was able to find Rudiger and he buried it like a champion. But Alex, you have a successful Instagram page in Havertz Hive 
So I know you're pro the Germans, as we all are here, but your thoughts on Rahul's analysis of Kai and Timo mainly. Yeah, I, I definitely think he's he's got to offer a little bit more. Um, it wasn't his very best performance. Again, it, it does sort of get overshadowed. As we've said, it's, it's, it's a little easier to overlook these things when you win um, because I do tend to sort of subscribe to the belief that not every player has to have a great game every game um, because when you have a squad that this, that's this good, that the, that's this deep, um, you, you're allowed to almost have a couple built-in off days because hopefully your teammates are picking up that slack. And in a sense, that was maybe the entire, for, for our whole attack, it wasn't quite quite working out uh, with the end product for them. And then our more defensive players banged three goals. So um, certainly I'd love to see a little more from Havertz, but yeah, I'm, I'm not discouraged um, because I feel like we know his class, we know his talent. I think he just has to keep training. He's still young. He's still... He's, he's in the toughest league in the world, um, but he's not like, he's not out of his depth. He's, he's got the quality. Um, and this is maybe just a question of rotating our players until we find out who can really solidify some good form, because the beauty of this situation is, you know what, Mason Mount isn't always going to have his, his trademark, brilliant, uh, just very solid, very consistent outing. Kai Havertz isn't always going to be at his brilliant best. Timo Werner might not always be slotting away those chances, but then you have Hudson Adoy, you have Pulisic coming back from injury. This is, this is a squad where we have enough talent all across the board um, to keep things fresh, keep things moving. Um, and in a way it's tough for me to worry too much about individual performances when there's almost always going to be someone ready to step up at least thus far. So Maybe my, my optimism will shift a little bit if we start struggling for results, if we have a couple games where we really fail to break people down. But at this point in the season, um, I'm just happy to see everyone contributing. I think Tiago Silva, people were saying, was our ninth goal scorer, I heard the commentator say, maybe, of the season. Um, I'm not sure. Someone can fact check me on that. But uh, And I'm not sure. Had Rudiger scored already this season when he grabbed our third? I don't think so, no. So, yeah. I don't know. It's maybe it's it's foolish optimism, but when all the cylinders are firing like this, um, it's difficult for me to get too down about one player's performance. So I hope Havertz and everyone else just keeps training hard and starts taking their chances because we've we've seriously built a team to be reckoned with here. Yeah, I mean, well said. I think both of you guys have valid points here and it's good to have different perspectives um, Rahul, a quick wrapping up thoughts on, on Rudiger. I know you've spoke a lot about him with uh, contract situation, his dude moment here. Uh, he's your play of the season so far. Um, really quickly, and then I'll ask you for a man of a match as well. No, I, I can't speak uh, you know, any more highly of Rudiger. He's been excellent, and um, it almost makes you wonder why uh, we haven't already given him the, the money that he wants. Um, but I'm sure we'll figure it out. Marina is at the wheel and, and she does what's best for the, for the club. Uh, and to Alex's point, I was just calculating. So I think Rudiger was the ninth different player to score. So um, he's right in that we have different goal scorers. Like I was telling you, Jackie, we, we have people popping up with goals. Um, I'm just a little more critical of Havertz and Timo because I, I want to see them succeed and I want to see them succeed now instead of uh, maybe next season or the season after. So that, that's all that my frustration comes out of. But uh, Rudiger, our defense, full, full credit to them. And uh, another point to, to uh, another feather in their cap is that we've now kept more clean sheets than goals we've conceded under Tuchel. Wow. Very, very high, high praise. I mean, it speaks for itself just hearing that stat right there. All right, Rahul, before I move on to Alex, do you have a man of the match for us? Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty easy. It's got to be Thiago Silva. It's defensively solid, um, communicating with his, def with his teammates around him and then um, popping up with the goal and maybe a second goal if that wasn't cleared off the line. So he was just solid all around. Fair enough. Alex, are you going with Thiago or somebody different? Um, I, think, I think fundamentally it's very difficult to go with anyone else uh, other than Thiago Silva, but... Uh, in the interest of keeping things fresh, I will offer maybe N'Golo Conte uh, in that we had a very slow first half. Conte comes on, changes the game, gets a goal, which is he does not do every day. 
Um, and we just looked a completely, completely different team with him on the pitch. And I don't know how many times we have to say that before people realize just how crucial he is. I know there have, there have been times he struggled for fitness. Even recently, he's coming off an injury. Um, he's certainly, he's not old, but he's not getting any younger. Uh, but the thing is, when he's fit, when he's, when he's on top of his game, and Golo Conte is unmatchable. You cannot replace him. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad he's still an asset in our team because there have been times when we weren't sure how much of a role he'd continue to play, but here he is. I mean, he was immense, immense last season under Tuchel, and now he's already starting out um, being a monstrous presence in that midfield. So you love to see it. And for me, I'll, I'll give a shout to N'Golo there uh, for how he changed that match. Yeah, very well described. And we tried a slightly different formation in that second half as well with the 3-5-2. So N'Golo coming in there was not only a tactical swap, uh, just bringing his presence there, but hopefully with the two strikers up front, we have a different weapon in our arsenal. Rahul, we asked uh, several people online for their man of the match, and overwhelmingly people agree with you. It's Thiago Silva. N'Golo Kante was in second place, and Rudiger was third. Uh, I'm actually going to go for Rudiger just because I think that he has this energy as well, similar to N'Golo Kante. He makes these amazing runs from left center back, which I'm like, hey, go back and defend. But if you're going to get a goal every now and then, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. So uh, again, all three of us different. All three of those guys are, have been incredible and helped in this game. And before we move on to talking about some other games, we had one comment come in, which was part of a moment of the match. And I thought it was a, a fun one to read out before we move on. And this comes from Benjamin underscore Chelsea underscore. His fun moment or his major moment of the game was my throat hurting and then Rudiger scores again and I scream more and my throat continues <laughs> to hurt more. So Benjamin, we're with you there. We keep yelling and screaming as well. I've lost my voice in the Champions League final before. So hopefully yeah. we get to live more, more moments of this as, as the season go on, guys. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Benjamin. It was I was yelling and my dog's looking at me like, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> All right, guys, should we talk about some other games now uh, in this episode here? I know that other teams are playing around. There's been a lot of talk around Manchester City's attendance record. I wouldn't get too deep into that. There's a lot of memes online about that. So if you're interested and you want to have a chuckle, definitely look that up. But Manchester City play to uh, Southampton and draw. Um, Alex, your thoughts on that game? I think it's, it's underwhelming, but every team is going to have an off day. This doesn't count them out as title contenders, doesn't mm -hmm. count them out as as a, a top competitor, I think this is, it's, it's sort of a routine slow day at the office. It happens, um, but they're coming off quite the exciting uh, Champions League win. I believe they won 6-3 there. So it's not, um, you know, nothing that you want to read too deeply into if that sort of lackluster performance continues, sure. Um, but I, we also have to mention, I think uh, Tino Livramento, was it uh, who who was really locking things down at the back for Southampton? So, uh, little shout to a player who we'll call is on a um, he's on on an expensive <laughs> loan in a sense. In that we do we do have a buyback clause on him. So uh, there's uh, Chelsea. I believe he was the academy player of the year uh, for us. Uh, we offered him a contract, but he wanted playing time. And who can blame him? Because it looks like he's really really impressing for Southampton. So hopefully he keeps killing it. And in a year or two, we, we bring back that gem, uh, yet another gem from our Academy. But yeah. I, I don't see this as something that, that will worry Man City too much as long as they get right back on it. Yeah. They've done, they've done this before Rahul back-to-back -back championships, but the back-to-back -back is even harder than winning it for the first time in a bit. So your thoughts on this game? It was, I mean, it was, like you said, it was all um, about the attendance and, the memes going around were just so funny. Uh, and then a full house shows up and they don't get the win. So I, I guess they can't perform in front of a full house. Um, <laughs> but jokes aside, they, I mean, on another day, City bang in a goal and then it just opens up and they get, you know, multiple goals. They don't get it. They only have one shot on target. And it begs the question is, would a, would a striker make a difference in this kind of a game? Uh, and that remains to be seen, especially with teams that kind of sit deep and just defend against them uh, Will they struggle to score? Uh, but it's City is City. They always find a way to bounce back and, and win. And hopefully they don't bounce back too soon because their next game is against us. Uh, and in fact, I was looking at this schedule. They have a, a kind of a, a 
crazy week coming up with Chelsea, PSG, and Liverpool all in the same week. So he's going to have to use that squad and hopefully rest a couple of guys when we face them. Yeah, and they have a deep and a big squad. So we'll see how that plays out for them. But we'll move on really quickly. Liverpool 3-0 versus Palace. And Alex, Liverpool are back to their best, it looks like. Yeah, they've definitely impressed this season. Um, I know we've, we've got the little stat line here that Liverpool have mimicked Chelsea's record, or I suppose today Chelsea mimicked Liverpool's record. So every Premier League uh, result that we've, we've had has been matched on the scoreline exactly. So uh, including that 1-1 uh, draw with them uh, where they scored a penalty with a little bit of uh, help from our favorite <laughs> Anthony Taylor. So, well, uh, you, you like to see there being a nice title race. So as much as as a Chelsea fan, it will be lovely to say, oh, every other big six club is in the mud. They're, they're failing. Their results are horrible. You know what? You got to gotta give a little bit of appreciation to an exciting season of the Premier League. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see how the title race develops. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, I'm not speaking too soon, but it seems as though Chelsea is solidly in the title race as of this point in time. Obviously, being top of the league, you can't really uh, deny that. Um, but I think it's, it's shaping up to be one heck of a season. And Liverpool... When in form, we know how good they are. We know how good Salah can be. He's inevitable. Um, and now we know how how good Chelsea can be after a performance like this, even though, frankly, we could have still played better. So <laughs> I think this this could be one exciting uh, one exciting title race this season. Hopefully, hopefully, though, the Blues come out on top. Yep, we're all hoping for the exact same thing, my friend. Rahul, what, what's the interesting stat, even though Chelsea and Liverpool have the exact same results? Why did Chelsea finish this weekend on top of the table? Yeah, so, it, I mean, usually it's goal difference, but Chelsea and Liverpool have the same goal difference too. So it comes to head-to-head, -head and uh, luckily or un un unluckily for Liverpool, we've played each other already this season, and Chelsea, being the away team from home, got the draw. So they sit above Liverpool, which, if you think about it, that's, an impressive result because if it comes down to these two teams at the end of the season and that's what separates us, that would have been another total masterclass. Yeah, with Ted Men, especially, that was a tough game. We've already covered it, but yeah, definitely great. Let's jump into Aston Villa and Everton. And guys, Everton were doing well so far, but Aston Villa just shifted into a different gear. And maybe, maybe Leon Bailey took them into a different gear. Rahul, I'll start with you here. Yeah, I, I missed that game, but I saw the result and I was like, this was not what I expected. I thought it'd be a lot closer and maybe even a draw because Everton have been pretty good. And, and Benitez, who's joined Everton, uh, has kept them kind of compact and kept things tight, but pops up against Villa and they score three times. And you mentioned uh, Leon Bailey, who comes on, scores a goal, goes off and gets the man of the match. That's I, I would love to have that kind of a work day. <laughs> Um, but no, I, I, Villa coming back into form, coming back into their own. And I think once they get their new signings all gelled in, they, yeah. they'll be up there too. Yeah. Alex, just a quick word on this game. Yeah. I, I think Bailey had, had a 20 minute man of the match outing. He was subbed <laughs> on in the 61st minute, forced an own goal with an assist in the 69th minute, scores a great goal in the 75th minute, and then got subbed <laughs> off in the 82nd minute. So, I mean, impressive from him um there, there's a there's a funny photo here of well you won't even be able to see it because of my background but there's a photo of him smirking from the bench after <laughs> picking up the man of the match award uh for a 20 minute little shift so really impressive there um that you have to say it's not it, it wasn't an absolute uh thrashing in any sense in that um people know you can call me an expected goals merchant but it was 0.81 for aston villa 0.67 for everton um, doesn't look like either of these teams significantly outcreated the other, but well done on securing that result uh, to Aston Villa. And hopefully, though, uh, Chelsea are, are fine to overcome. Them. Yep, we're playing them soon. So hopefully that Leon Bailey is not going to have a, a masterclass that day. Rahul, you and I both picked Brighton to be relegated. And here they are beating Leicester 2-1. I, I don't know what more to <laughs> say. It's been... It's been that's the way things have been for them this season. They picked up four wins already out of a possible five, and um, they're doing well. I think maybe I think this is the third season under Graham Potter, maybe the second. Uh, they seem to be understanding and doing things a lot better than um, you know the first time around under him. And 
uh, they're getting the goals, which was, I think, their biggest issue last season was they were playing the beautiful football, but they couldn't get the goals and they're getting them now. And they beat Leicester City, which um, concerning times for them because they've only picked up two wins out of a possible five. And uh, maybe, I don't want to get ahead and make predictions or, 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 or anything, but maybe the Leicester City kind of bubble of being in the top four might have been burst. Uh, but we'll see how that goes. And Brighton currently sit in fourth place. <laughs> Yeah, incredible. Alex, I don't know if I can't remember if you picked Brighton to be relegated, but nevertheless, I think early days, very impressive. Yeah, I I, I, I will say, uh, I'll stay honest, I believe I did. Uh, <laughs> no, it wasn't necessarily, it was more, more informed by the, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I will say it wasn't necessarily a very informed prediction. It was, it was a bit of, of throwing one out there. Um, Because frankly, I I don't know too much about Brighton as a team, how how well they've been playing, how they've been gelling. Um, From what we can see, it looks like they're doing pretty well, seeing as they're sitting in the top four. So Champions League run for Brighton, anyone. Um, And (laughs) all I can say about Leicester is haven't been the same team since our boy Amarte (laughs) through the Chelsea pennant. So I I think some kind of of Tuchel juju must have come back (laughs) and, and haunted Leicester because... Yeah, they they just they don't look themselves um, or maybe maybe they do look themselves. Maybe this is the Lester that that maybe, maybe this is their level. So, you know what? Uh, I still harbor a little bit of a little bit of frostiness towards that team after the events of last season. So I'm not crying to see them uh, get, get put under by Brighton so they can enjoy their their FA Cup win. Uh, we'll enjoy our title charge. There you go. Rahul, this is why we, we like having Alex on it. He brings a lot of spice to the podcast <laughs> over here. But let, let's move on really quickly. Ronaldo is a machine guy scoring again for Manchester United with them beating West Ham 2-1. But that game had all sorts of crazy moments, Rahul. Yeah, it was, it woke up, I guess you could say early, but uh, a good game to watch. And Ronaldo, man, it's it's like he said, Salah is uh, inevitable. Ronaldo is inevitable. He just yeah. pops up uh, when you least expect it. And he, again, he follows on to shots and, and crosses that other players might be like, you know what? I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to leave it. He says, I'm going to maybe not get it, but then I'm going to get the rebound, which in right. this case, two weeks in a row, he's gotten it and he scores and um, United get the business done. Eventually um, could have had a couple of penalties. I, don't know if VAR this season has gone the opposite way and said, we're not going to give anything until it's like a rugby tackle. <laughs> um, and then they give the handball for West Ham, which I'm going to reference Alex's favorite manager here. Garrett Southgate did this in, in the Euros where he brings on players just for penalties. And Moyes does that with Noble. Of course, Noble has a great record. Um, but it's just that pressure of that situation that, you know, sometimes people can't take it and, and he misses and, misses an opportunity to get West Ham a well-deserved point. Yeah, absolutely. Alex, your thoughts on Ronaldo the machine and maybe David Moyes' last-minute substitution for a penalty? Yeah, I certainly think Ronaldo, I mean, as you said, he's, he's inevitable. He always comes up with the goal. I think that he's someone who I've always defended, uh, CR7, because I think just due to the fact that Messi is so brilliant and people – always especially online will pit the two against each other in the classic goat debate I think Ronaldo almost gets a bit too much disrespect um, because as much as as I have slowly come around to the mindset that that in talent terms Messi has to sort of be the goat um, I think you literally cannot ask for a better goal scorer a better constant threat a better big game player a better uh, just a pure better finisher. He just comes up when his team needs him. He's a poacher, but that's not even like an insult. People act like tap-ins are, are easy. Okay. Well, then you go, go <laughs> to the premier league and get three goals in your first two games off tap-ins. It's, it's not an easy feat. And everywhere he goes, he just consistently delivers. So nothing, nothing but praise for Ronaldo, to be honest, because I've always had a soft spot for him. Um, and here he is again, delivering the goods. I hope he comes up firing blanks against Chelsea. But aside from that, I'm, I'm happy to see him succeed in the Premier League again. I think this is shaping up to be one classic of a season. I know I mentioned Chelsea and Liverpool in the title race. Manchester United are on the exact same points. Um, and what a season this would be if you had Salah firing Liverpool into a title race, Lukaku banging in goals for Chelsea. 
Cristiano Ronaldo banging in goals for Man United. Um, the the bald fraud still strikerless, <laughs> slipping further low in the tape. No, but but I, I would love to see every team just go all out. Um, and you know, Chelsea to uh, to take it in the end. But we'll 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 see what happens. Um, respect to Ronaldo, but West Ham were a little hard done by there. So yeah. uh, I guess it was their own doing perhaps in the end. So, yep, absolutely. So I'll run through the Premier League table very, very quickly. And then Rahul, you can wrap us up here, but uh, business as usual for Chelsea, sitting at the top of the league with 13 points. You'd already covered that their exact same record with Liverpool, who are sitting in second, just based on head to head with 13 points as well. No shocker here, Ronaldo and Manchester United with 13 points as well, sitting in third. So very, very tight days at the top. But again, it's early days, five matches so far. Uh, I'm going to go to the top five because I think it's worth mentioning. Brighton sit in fourth with 12 points. I think that's always a great stat. And then Manchester City in fifth with 10 points. But very, very close in the middle of the table. I'll go to the bottom three, which is Norwich with nothing on the board yet. So tough days for Norwich and looking towards the remainder of the season. Burnley sitting in 19th and poor old Newcastle sitting in 18th with only two points. So it's early days again, like I said, but it's going to be an interesting Premier League season, guys. It definitely is. And um, I think eventually as we get further on the benches or, or the deeper squads might make the difference. And with Salah going away to African Cup of Nations, that may be our opportunity um, to maybe pull away, but we'll see. We'll see. Not trying to get ahead of ourselves, but just sharing a little bit of um, speed bumps coming up for maybe Liverpool. Um, but I think we have Villa coming up in the Carabao Cup bro, uh, in midweek and um, another opportunity, another competition for Tuchel to maybe uh, make a run for. So uh, before we wrap it up, any particular rotations? Pulisic maybe comes back, Alex? Yeah, I mean, I certainly wouldn't rush him back if he's not at full fitness, because I think um, full recovery is more important than getting him out there just for this next game. I'm not sure if he'll be available. I haven't seen any official word on that. Um, frankly, uh, I would love to see him make his make his return against Manchester City. Um, I don't want to don't want to rush him back too soon um, because I think this could be a great opportunity Uh as a someone with a bit of a Pulisic bias for him to <coughs> make a good run in the starting 11. Um, and I'm, I was a Chelsea fan. I've been a Chelsea fan for over a decade now. So I, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't put him above the team. If the team's playing well, the team's playing well. But as I said, it's Mason Mount, not particularly impressive. I love him. We know how good he is, but it's the same with Kai Havertz. Hasn't quite been showing us the levels we know he can hit. And Timo Werner grabbed a good assist, so I'll I'll never hate on him for that. But he didn't quite he didn't quite show the the clinical side that we've all been hoping he can find um, with his little cameo today. So there is absolutely a path for a fully fit Pulisic to come in, make an impact, start putting away some of these chances we've been wasting. And I am dying to see his link up with Romelu Lukaku because Lukaku his playmaking skills today were quite impressive. He was honestly hard done by not to get a couple assists um and i think Pulisic could be the player that that starts getting lukaku on the assist sheet so we'll see how that goes but um i would be excited to have him back i don't want to rush him back too soon and, and that's fair i think we've in the past maybe rushed him back and then struggled in terms of having him out for a longer period of time so uh jackie any rotation thoughts from you lukaku maybe gets a, a rest yeah, traditionally Chelsea in the last, I would say, five, six season hasn't really prioritized the Carabao Cup. So I expect wholesale rotations. I would expect Chaloba to come back in and get 90 minutes. I'd expect Ben Chilwell to actually get 90 minutes yeah. in this particular game as well. You'd probably see Callum hudson odoi come back as well. Maybe Hakim Ziyech. So yeah, absolutely. Maybe Saul will get 90 Saul, minutes yeah. for the first time. So I think, yeah, we have a big enough squad and some of the guys who haven't got enough minutes so far that we're going to rely on, especially in that second half of the season, I would definitely expect them. And may, I wouldn't be surprised if Kepa gets back-to-back -back games, whether or not Mendy's fit. Uh, it's a Carabao Cup, and I think it's good for his confidence as well to have a couple of back-to-back -back games. So wholesale changes, uh, but we do have quality in, in each position. Uh, either way, no matter what happens, I do expect Chelsea to come out with the result, regardless of who we put out there. So I'm hopeful for a one or two nil win at the end of the day. 
Yeah, same here. I, I'd like to see a couple of different faces, but as long as we get the win, um, because next up is City, and uh, we will do an episode on that later in the week. But that wraps it up, guys. Thank you very much for listening. Please continue to subscribe, like, uh, and follow us at the Premier Chels on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Instagram, and on Twitter, it's at Premier Chels. Uh, please also give Alex a follow. It's at PulisicFC22 on Instagram. Uh, and as always, send us your feedback and keep interacting with us on Instagram. And we will be back later this week uh, to do a Villa Carabao Cup review uh, and a Manchester City preview. But until then, stay safe and up the Chels.